Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Are you enjoying your curfew? Are you enjoying your imprisonment? Are you enjoying having your freedom removed? Are you enjoying a little taste of fascism? It's not possible to get reliable data on how many people are ill or whether people are dying. But some reports that I've seen suggest there are no more deaths or illnesses occurring at this time than we would expect at any other time. It appears deaths of people who are old or unhealthy, who would have died anyway, are being classed as COVID deaths. And people with regular cold or flu symptoms are being classed as COVID patients. Figures being quoted by mainstream media, as usual, have been plucked out of thin air. Anyone who is quoting numbers or showing graphs of cases or deaths have no way of knowing that their data is correct. Andrew Johnson has looked up figures from the Office of National Statistics on the total number of deaths in England and Wales in the first three months of 2017, 18, 19 and 20. The results do not strongly support the conclusion that COVID-19 is an epidemic or a pandemic. And figures from other countries show similar numbers. People are reporting that hospitals are not overly busy. I don't see evidence of a disease spreading in the population. Do you? I see evidence of the mainstream media making a poor job of pretending this is what's happening. Besides all that, medical science's explanation of how certain diseases occur is highly questionable. Do diseases physically spread? Does a disease physically transfer from one person to another, then sometime later from that person to a third person? I do not believe that is how it works. Diseases are caused or triggered by environmental factors, i.e. Uh, things that are toxic, or psychological factors, or poor health. In a presentation shared by Andrew Johnson and referenced recently by David Icke, by Dr Andrew Kaufman, he lays out the reasons why he believes that what they are calling the coronavirus is already recognised in science as exosomes which are emitted by cells in times of stress, meaning exosomes are not passed from one person to another. If diseases do not physically jump from person to person, as I suspect, all the current lockdown and distancing measures are totally unnecessary. If diseases do jump from person to person, then, according to mainstream medical science, allowing this to happen would build up immunity in the population. So whichever case is true, the current measures are totally unnecessary. I do not believe lives are being saved by being made to stand outside the chip shop while waiting to be served my fish and chips. I do not believe lives are being saved by closing every single pub in the country including the Grey Horse in concert. I do not believe lives are being saved by people wearing face masks. It took five years before people took those stupid red noses off the front of their cars. Are people going to be wearing Hannibal Lecter face masks for the next five f***ing years? The building trade is grinding to a halt. This is madness. This is fascism. This is an abuse of human rights. The lockdown has got bugger all to do with saving lives. Let's look at some possibilities for the real reason why these lockdown measures have been imposed. A key person I think we need to look at, who I suspect is the architect of the criminal corona curfew, is Bill Gates who appeared recently on BBC Breakfast News. Gates has not been elected, he has no medical qualifications, and he is not British. Yet, the BBC spoke to him as if his word on this issue was somehow the word on this issue. 
Here is some of what Bill Gates said. The thing that will get us back to the world that we had before coronavirus is the vaccine and getting that out to all 7 billion people. So we're going to have to take something that usually takes five or six years and get it done in 18 months. Uh, there are There is an approach called an RNA vaccine that people like Moderna, CureVac, and several others have that looks quite promising, but we can't count on that. So we'll back you know, four or five of those and four or five uh, companies using a more conventional approach. The people like myself and Tony Fauci are saying 18 months. If everything went perfectly, we could do slightly better than that, but there will be a trade-off. We'll have less safety testing than we typically would have. And so governments will have to decide, you know, do they indemnify the companies and really say, let's, let's go out with this. You know, we weren't ready for this pandemic, but I do think we will be ready for the next pandemic. And using uh, the new tools of science, that's very, very doable. You know, funding the research for these type of vaccines, uh, you know, actually our foundation is the biggest funder of vaccines for infectious disease. Do you think things will go back to normal or is that all changed? No, the once you have a safe and effective vaccine and get that out to almost all of the people on the planet uh, and build the preparatory systems for the next pandemic uh, so you can nip it in the bud, we will go back to normal. I'm looking at getting statement analysis done on Bill Gates, but for now, here are my own thoughts at this time. Many people are claiming that Bill Gates' objective is to depopulate the planet. In other words, the vaccines he is involved in developing are going to create infertility or even kill large sections of the population. I was interested in these claims, so I decided to examine some of Bill Gates' previous interviews to see if I could find any clues about depopulation. Let's go to a couple of questions that we've actually received since we started the, the webcast. Uh, the first is on population growth, and the question is, one of our most press pressing issues is population growth. How do you uh, expect this to be addressed? Well, the population growth issue at the global level is not that daunting. That is, the population percentage-wise is growing slower today than in the past, and so it will actually peak out. The problem is that the population is growing the fastest where people are less able to deal with it. So it's in the very poorest places that you're going to have a tripling in population by 2050. And so their ability to feed, educate, provide jobs, stability, protect the environment in those locations mean uh, you know, they're faced with an almost impossible problem. Northern Nigeria, Yemen, Chad. Uh, and so what we need to do is take this aid generosity and this innovation and go into those places, uh, offer the women better tools where they want to space birthing or, or have a smaller family size, and improve health because it's amazingly, as, as children survive, parents feel like they'll have enough uh, kids to support them in their old age and so they choose to have less children. I don't think that clip proves much. He is saying that in poor countries where people have large families, if you improve the health of those countries and reduce the childhood death rate, families would no longer need to have as many children. That seems like a reasonable argument to me. If you know of any other Bill Gates quotes which suggest he might be interested in depopulation, please email them to me. The second point is about Bill Gates' father, who was apparently interested in eugenics. He served on the board of Planned Parenthood, which was a rebranded organisation birthed out of the American Eugenics Society. Planned Parenthood was built on population control schemes and allied with the same groups who wanted genetic hierarchy laws to preserve humanity and who sought to beautify countries by stopping the unfit from reproducing. To me this sounds worrying. 
let's bear it in mind as we proceed. If we're going to understand what's going on with the current despicable situation, we need to look closely at Bill Gates and try and explain his modus operandi. Bill Gates is often referred to as a philanthropist. I disagree with this description. I do not believe that Bill Gates gives out a single dollar of his money unless there is a possibility that by giving away that dollar he might get more than his dollar back. I suspect all of his philanthropic activities to save lives and improve global health are intended to be money-making activities in the long run. I listened to a number of Bill Gates interviews listed here. In them, he speaks about his various health projects with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that he started in 2000. In the interviews, I could not find anything that made me think he was being motivated by a wish to depopulate the planet. Bear with me here while I make my point. He comes across as though he is, to a reasonable degree, seeking to develop new treatments and techniques including vaccines, which he claims, and which he perhaps believes, can be argued will assist humanity. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, it is claimed, has committed money to infectious disease control, malaria control, STDs, HIV and AIDS, TB, reproductive health care, etc. It has put money into Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, which is committed to immunisation of poor countries. It has put money into the World Health Organisation and many other organisations. I want to go back now to his early days at Microsoft. If you don't already know, uh, Bill Gates became the richest man in the world because he was the main shareholder in a tiny startup company called Microsoft. Microsoft became mainly involved in developing operating system software for home and business computers. Most people will be familiar with Microsoft Windows software, which is what you use to navigate your way around a desktop computer or a laptop. Back in 1980, before anyone had heard of Microsoft, Microsoft was asked by IBM to provide an operating system for one of their early personal computers. Microsoft made a deal with the authors of the already developed 86DOS operating system and adapted it to run on IBM computers. Although the operating system software was delivered for a one-time fee of $50,000, Bill Gates did not offer to transfer the copyright of the operating system to IBM. He believed that other personal computer makers would copy IBM's PC hardware. They did which made the IBM-compatible PC running his DOS program the de facto industry standard. Microsoft became the exclusive licensing agent and owners of the DOS operating system. So the reason why Bill Gates made so much money is because he held the license for MS-DOS, which meant that every IBM-compatible computer that was produced containing MS-DOS earned him $40 a time. But that was just the start, because after DOS came the more complex operating system, Windows 1.0, which again was sold with most new IBM compatible computers. As computers got more powerful, new Windows operating systems were developed. Windows 2.0, Windows 3.0, Windows 3.1, in 1995, Windows 95, in 1998, Windows 98, at the Millennium, Windows Millennium, Windows NT, Windows 2000, Windows XP, etc, etc. Windows XP typically cost $200, so by the early 2000s, Bill Gates was earning $200 for the vast majority of computers produced for the home and business markets. Think about how much money that must be. Bear in mind that once the operating system is developed, the software can be copied millions of times for next to no cost. His Microsoft business became like a license to print money which made him the richest man in the world. Gates' current net worth is estimated to be $107 billion. That's $107,000 million. Are you beginning to understand 
Bill Gates's modus operandi. I will define it for you. He likes to own the license for something which is simple to copy that he can sell a billion times and charge whatever he can get away with each time. Let me repeat that. He likes to own the license for something which is simple to copy that he can sell a billion times and charge whatever he can get away with each time. This is his modus operandi. He is incredibly greedy for money and much of that money has arisen because he owned the license for Microsoft Windows. Now think about vaccines. Once he's developed his vaccine, he owns the license for the vaccine. And his intention is to sell that vaccine to every single person on this planet. Either paid for by their government or themselves. He doesn't care. This is very similar to the way he sold operating systems for every single computer on this planet. So Windows 1.0 is very similar to Coronavirus 1.0. Or should I say Corona Vaccine 1.0. Once he sold Corona Vaccine 1.0 to every single person on the planet, the virus will mutate. And we will then need Corona Vaccine 2.0, just like we needed Windows 2.0. Then Corona Vaccine 3.0 just like we needed Windows 3.0, etc, etc. As many of you will know, many of Bill Gates' operating systems didn't work very well. Anyone remember Windows XP Service Pack 1? It was full of bugs, but that didn't matter to Bill. His focus was not on the quality of his product, but on the scale of his sales. And why should we believe his vaccine endeavours will be any different? Just as the need for operating systems changed, so will the need for vaccines change. He can bring out a new vaccine every three years, just like he did with his operating systems, and sell them to every single person on the planet again and again and again. Are you seeing the Bill Gates modus operandi? Can you see now why he is interested in health and vaccines? He is interested in health and vaccines because he can sell each vaccine six billion times. Remember, he likes to own the license for something which is simple to copy that he can sell a billion times and charge whatever he can get away with each time. It doesn't even matter if governments cannot afford it because he is going to loan the governments that money and get it back over time. You know, we'll write checks for those factories faster than governments can, and they'll come along. What a crafty thing to say. He makes it sound like he is giving the money away. He doesn't mean that. He means he will loan money to governments so he can sell his product. Riba! But for his post-Microsoft racket to work, Bill needs a global pandemic. How is it possible to create a pandemic. There is no doubt in my mind that the current situation has been created and as Andrew Johnson concludes is a scam. We know it's a scam because Bill Gates and his cohorts organized a conference in October 2019 intended to provide recommendations to world governments on what measures they should enforce when faced with a future coronavirus pandemic. Here are some clips from the conference Bill Gates helped to organize in October last year. The goal of the Event 201 exercise is to illustrate the potential consequences of a pandemic and the kinds of societal and economic challenges it would pose. The scenario also highlights the very critical role that global business and public-private partnerships play in preparing for and responding to pandemics. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. The board is comprised of highly experienced leaders from business, public health, and civil society. 
The board's recommendations are aimed at top decision makers in national governments. The board's recommendations are aimed at top decision makers in national governments. So the lockdown measures and distancing measures we are all suffering with right now were recommended to our governments in October 2019 by a conference that was set up by Bill Gates. This was just six weeks before the start of the alleged pandemic. We know that social media is now the primary way that many people get their news. So interruptions to these platforms could curb the spread of misinformation, but could also limit access to information from legitimate sources. Health ministries around the world are attempting to combat mis- and disinformation by amplifying public health messaging through social and traditional media. But they are being outpaced by false and misleading information. National governments are considering or have already implemented a range of interventions to combat misinformation. Some governments have taken control of national access to the internet. Others are censoring websites and social media content. And a small number have shut down internet access completely to prevent the spread of misinformation. Penalties have been put in place for spreading harmful falsehoods, including arrests. But we all know that there will be a next virus. But let's face it, we have to keep the awareness up, we have to talk about it, we have to get ready in due time, we have to set up platforms to exchange our information in due time, and that's the way how we can convince the companies, the leaders, and the organizations about this need. I wanted to follow up on the trusted voice idea. Yeah. Um, I think everyone around the table spoke about how important it is to find those voices. Do we need to find them now? and establish trust in those voices now so that when the crisis hits, people already have the established trust. Thoughts? I mean, I would say without question, and because you're in a better position to have built up that bank of goodwill um, in advance of a crisis. And I'm, I'm very intrigued and I think very, um, heartened by the conversation about the identification of community and faith-based leaders in particular, um, because they do foster enormous trust at a local level. People are avoiding public spaces out of fear of infection and in compliance with public health recommendations. This has had a dramatic effect on the retail and service sectors. Businesses of all kinds are struggling to operate, let alone provide basic services. How should national leaders businesses and international organizations balance the risk of worsening disease that would be caused by the continued movement of people around the world against the risks of profound economic consequence of travel and trade bans. I think the statement about what would happen even in the absence of any government intervention, travel would decrease. People are not gonna, they're gonna know what the information is about where disease is and not travel there. I think that there is an important role for government to not make a bad situation worse. Mm -hmm. And that is largely going to be communicating um, valid and trusted information about where the problem is so that people can make their own decisions and that whatever guidance the government, national governments do provide is, uh, is tailored to where, what the situation actually is. I, I think there is a spectrum of interventions. Note, this conference that prepared recommendations for world governments in the event of a global coronavirus pandemic was held before the coronavirus outbreak, not after. How can anyone not see that this event was no coincidence? But how is it possible for one man to create all this? Well, it's because he's incredibly rich and he has been bankrolling all the organizations and individuals in order to make it all happen, including bankrolling the UK government's chief medical officer, Chris Whitty. He's bankrolling our government to get them to do what he wants. Now, in order for Bill Gates' strategy to work, he needs customers, so he needs the population. If immediate depopulation was on his agenda, he's not going to have any customers for his Corona vaccine 2.0. So for that reason, I don't think drastic depopulation is the main goal of Bill Gates. It may be the goal of others, however. 
One thing he has done is used poor countries like guinea pigs or testing grounds to trial and test some of his medical products in the knowledge that once they work, he can sell them at a premium to rich countries. He did something similar with his operating systems when he made it easy for home users to make pirate copies of Windows 98 with the intention that this would lead to Windows becoming the preferred choice of businesses who have a lot more money than home users. With the current so-called coronavirus outbreak, if Bill said he had the vaccine ready now, that would be far too early and even hardcore mainstream medics would smell a rat. So he's saying the vaccine might be ready in 18 months' time. The current curfew and isolation measures are playing right into Bill Gates' hands. He doesn't want people coming out of lockdown and being exposed to the virus, and then catching the virus and becoming immune, because they wouldn't need to buy his vaccine. According to him, once somebody has had a vaccine, they can come out of lockdown and will be free to travel again. But in order for the authorities to know who has had the vaccine, who has had the disease and who has had neither, Bill wants people to carry certificates. Now, we don't want to have a lot of recovered people. You know, to be clear, we're trying through the shutdown uh, in the United States to not get to 1% of the population infected. We're well below that today, but with exponentiation, you know, you could get past uh, that, that 3 million. I'm, I'm, I believe we will be able to avoid that uh, with the, um, having this economic pain. Eventually, what we'll have to have is certificates of who's a recovered person, who's a vaccinated person, because you don't want people moving around the world now, he doesn't say whether these are paper certificates. I suspect he has used the word certificate because certificates can be digital and carried on a microchip. He wants every person to be identified by a chip on their person. And on that chip, which can be read by the authorities, will be your current vaccine or virus status. That will allow Bill to know whether he has had his money from you or from your government. Once he knows he's had his money, i.e. you've had your vaccine, you can come out of your house and be free from lockdown. Oh, and the chip will also report your geographic location, just to make sure that those who are still in lockdown stay in lockdown. How will your chip report your location? One way that could be used would be to use the 5G network. 5G is stated to be compatible with new RFID technology. Once the system is in place, all Bill needs to do to rape the world of its money again is create another pandemic and bring out a new vaccine. Vaccine 2.0, followed by vaccine 3.0, followed by vaccine 95, vaccine 98, vaccine 2000 and vaccine XP. <clears throat> is anyone sitting watching this thinking, what a great idea? Because you can bet your ass, your government thinks it's a good idea. <clears throat> Help keep people safe. Help keep the NHS safe. Clap your hands at 8 o'clock like a demented seal. On the one hand, your government is telling everyone to stay indoors. But on the other, it is telling everyone to come out of their house at exactly the same time and clap their filthy hands like a demented seal. Once you've got your chip fitted on your person to identify you, report your location and log your current vaccine status, it won't stop there. Why not use the chip to do other things like storing your money, monitoring your heart rate, your mood, and how about monitoring your opinion? They wouldn't do that, would they? We must ask, what is the capability of any technology that's proposed, not what is the intent? Because as Ben Emlyn Jones pointed out, the intent can change. Bill Gates loves technology, 
and he loves collecting data. He made his money out of the home computer revolution, but missed out on the mobile phone revolution. I think he sees the implantable chip as the next technological revolution, and he's positioning himself to make money out of it, with the help of his totally unnecessary vaccines. If and when human beings start to be implanted with a microchip, there will probably be one corporation that has the license for the operating system. And Bill Gates wants it. Remember, he likes to own the license for something which is simple to copy, that he can sell a billion times and charge whatever he can get away with each time. Operating systems, vaccines, implantable chips. Now I am certain there are powerful people other than Bill Gates who are happy to let Bill get on with his money-making agendas because it suits and enhances their own political agendas. The agendas of the global cabal that want to control humanity and bring about a new world order. It looks like a deliberate attempt to cause an economic crash. Speaking of which, where is the government going to get all of the money for the bailouts that it is promising? I thought the government was skint. Is this about engineering more debt? Or is there some sort of major new economic system being planned? I wish I knew. It's possible now to put nanotechnology into a vaccine and nanotechnology can receive messages or triggers from the 5G system. So one scenario which may or may not be on the agenda would be to use a vaccine which could be activated at any time using 5G or other stimuli to produce certain desired effects, perhaps even death. So is this the link between 5G and the current virus agenda? Or do they want to create an internet of people? The way the government recently refuted a link between 5G and the alleged coronavirus was woeful. They completely misquoted the 5G claims. People are not saying that 5G is accelerating the spread of the virus. They are saying that 5G is damaging to health and might be responsible for flu-like symptoms. So they are asking whether the corona scam has been manufactured to hide the real cause of the symptoms. Perfectly reasonable question. The fact that the government had to refute the 5G claims means the government are desperate for some reason to enforce the installation of 5G against the wishes of many informed people. Why can't we have a public debate and a public vote on whether we install 5G? Now, if we are asked to take a vaccine, Mandatory vaccination would be in direct violation of the Nuremberg Code and a violation of Article 6 of the UNESCO 2005 Statement on Bioethics and Human Rights. Limiting people's freedom to work, travel and access services based on some kind of immunity passport is also a breach of human rights. So how do we oppose this new fascism? You oppose this fascism by opposing the unnecessary measures, the curfew, the isolation and lockdown. We must oppose all of that. You oppose this fascism by opposing any and all vaccines. You oppose this fascism by opposing identity technology which may be used to track, monitor or imprison you. If you don't oppose all of the above now, they will take away your freedom. Get active and oppose the fascist world dictatorship that has reared its ugly head. You can download Andrew Johnson's 24-page document, The Corona Pandemic, Challenging the Narrative, and a 33-page document, Evidence the COVID-19 Pandemic is False. I've also produced an A4 leaflet that you can download and print out and distribute in your community, or feel free to devise your own. Eat a varied diet, take exercise, banish fear from your heart.
believe that you do create your own future. You do create your own future and that you can thwart tyranny and fascism. Believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night.